In our last lecture on proving the inspiration of the Bible, we were introduced to it as the Word of God, which once understood must be believed and obeyed. On these next two lectures, we deal with the understanding of its message. Number seven, the interpretation of the Bible is essentially ascertaining what the Bible teaches or how it informs us. In the next lecture on illumination, we're discussing the way in which it not only informs us, but actually transforms us. You will remember that we concluded our lecture on the proof of the inspiration of the Bible with a statement that we considered ourselves as having proven its inspiration and felt that it was mandatory for all Christians to be able to prove the Bible to be the Word of God, but only God himself could persuade a person, could persuade a person of its inspiration. That's what we're dealing with in Lecture 8, but first of all, let me read briefly number seven, interpretation of the Bible. One, the Bible is utterly unique, the Word of God, but its interpretation is standard, garden variety. Two, you read it just as any other book, with its prose, its poetry, its figures of speech, similes, tropes, parables, allegories. They're all there. Three, since this book alone is infallible, you know that it doesn't contradict itself, or one verse would be calling another wrong, when none is or could conceivably be wrong. Four, you normally expect other books not to contradict themselves, but you're not surprised when they do. You are not surprised. You're in a state of shock if the Word of God does. You know it doesn't. So when you think it does err, you know you err. Then look again until you find the correct, consistent interpretation. Five, another warning. This book does not flatter, cajole, or cultivate. It blows your hard, built-up self-esteem, abandoned pride, all who enter here. Six, if you are capable of being insulted, you can't interpret this book correctly. Seven, you won't believe what the Bible says if you won't believe how bad you are. Only conscious sinners can interpret the Bible honestly. Eight, the righteous can't let this word have free course because that would spell the end of their self-righteousness. They have a vested interest in unsound interpreting. Nine, they are not about to part with their pride because of the Word of God. Ten, there's really only one unobvious rule in hermeneutics, the science of interpretation. Never forget the noetic influence of sin. That means a bad person is a bad interpreter of the Word of God. I said earlier, you have to be conscious of your badness and aware of it, but if you yield to it, the noetic influence of sin will lead you to misinterpret the Bible. Now let's go back to the beginning and look more closely at these ten propositions. One, the Bible is utterly unique, the Word of God, but its interpretation is standard, garden variety. I make that point because you know, some of you may never have heard this or heard of anybody who falls into this particular trap. I can assure you there are many who do think that unless you are born again, you cannot interpret the Bible correctly. 
So though they might agree with me that its interpretation should follow certain standard rules, they insist that an unconverted person can follow those rules. You really have to be born again to understand what the Bible is saying. No, you don't. A Hindu or a Jew or a pagan or a Christian scientist or a Mormon or a sheer secularist is quite capable of interpreting the New Testament very accurately. As a matter of fact, capable of interpreting it more accurately than a sound and orthodox Christian does. The reason for that is this is standard literature and it follows standard rules of interpreting literature and people who know and practice those could very well understand the New Testament better than some people who are born again who don't understand those things especially if they labor under the notion that you can't understand unless you're born again. You understand now, a person who's not born again is not going to like what he reads, and he is, as we'll notice here before, he's going to be tempted to twist it around so that it says something he can live with, but the point is he's quite able to interpret it, and in a certain sense, I may say that's the difference between a radical and a liberal, as we use the terms in theology. A radical is a person who, interpreting the Bible correctly, says this is what the Bible says, but I don't believe it. But if you're asking me what does it teach, this is it. If you ask me whether I accept it, the answer is no. Now, a liberal is a person who can't resist the temptation when he once knows it and doesn't like what the Bible teaches to twist it and make it say something he does like. For example, years ago, when I was doing my doctoral work at Harvard, most of the men on the faculty were liberal, but they had a radical insight. People like Cadbury, for example, who would say, if you want to know what the Bible teaches, it's essentially Calvinism. John Calvin had it right. Not Arminius, but Calvin. But we don't believe Calvin. We don't believe the Bible. We don't think God is Trinitarian, and we don't accept the idea that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead who took upon himself a human nature. But if you ask us what the Bible says, that's it. There it is, you see. That's very important for us to recognize at the outset that a person who is not committed to evangelical Christianity, doesn't accept it himself, is quite capable of interpreting it accurately and even admitting that that's what the Bible says when he himself rejects it, whereas some, and these are the people to be most deeply deplored, actually misrepresent it and try to make it teach something it doesn't teach because they don't want to be out of line with it. I could go further on that, but you can do that on your own as to why psychologically that phenomenon exists. Second, you read it just as any other book with its prose, its poetry, its figures of speech, similes, tropes, parables, allegories, they're all there, and you interpret them accordingly. You get into some very deep questions as to whether something is a straight didactic statement 
or a figure of speech, a metaphor, when Jesus Christ says about that bread, this is my body, does he mean that that bread he holds in his hands has become his body, this is my body, or that bread he holds in his hands represents his body? You raise questions like that, but the point is the procedure for ascertaining those things, the answer to it is quite standard and anybody's capable of following it, and everybody ought to follow, to ascertain what the Bible teaches independently of whether he personally concurs with the judgment or not. Though manifestly, if he believes it's the Word of God, he's going to concur with it. Three, since this book alone is infallible, you know that it doesn't contradict itself or one verse would be calling another wrong when none is or could conceivably be. Now here is a point that has to be repeated constantly almost every hour on the hour to the conservative world here, people who take the Bible seriously and want to be controlled by it, there cannot be contradictions in it. There are all sorts of persons who talk about contradictions and antinomies and such things as that. If they mean apparent contradictions, seeming contradictions, yes. Manifestly, at first glance, something can look as if it appears different from something else and the two propositions mutually exclusive. It can seem that way, and if it seems that way, say so, interpret so. But at the same time, you have to know if our Lecture 6 is sound, this book is the Word of God, it can't be so. You understand why it can't be so? Some people seem to talk about this and entertain it as a possibility, and the only way they can do that is not realize what they're talking about. Let me make it plain to you why it's impossible for a book which is the truth of God and communicates his knowledge infallibly, can't conceivably contradict itself in one passage. James can't be against Paul. There can't be any competition between Moses and Christ. There has to be perfect harmony throughout because if there were not, Proposition A in the Bible would be saying about Proposition B that it's wrong. Or if you entertained the idea that Proposition B was correct, it would be saying that text A was in error, since that is utterly impossible. Blasphemous, remember, as we said last time, because God cannot lie, and that's what would be involved if A was against B, A would be saying B is a lie. Or B would be saying A is a lie. Let me give you an illustration of this because I think you would probably imagine that there wouldn't be anybody who has any real respect for the Bible who would go around saying things like that. Well, this is the way it happened. Jesus Christ is God. Proposition A. Proposition B, Christ is not God. There are people who say that. Now, you know, if this is true, this is false. If this is true, this is false. If God said this, he lied when he said that. If God said that, he lied when he said this. It's blasphemy to utter it. Can't possibly be. Now, what they actually mean or what's driven them to that is that Jesus Christ is also man. But it's one thing to say that Christ is God and man. It's another thing to say that Christ is not God because he's man. He is God who took upon himself human nature. That is not a mutually exclusive concept. 
It's mysterious and profound and transcendental, but no one can say God could not unite a divine, a human nature with him without ceasing to be God. This is just shabby thinking. Here, one more illustration of that. God is sovereign. God is not sovereign. Now, there again, if God teaches in his word he's sovereign, he's lying when he says he's not sovereign. If he says he's not sovereign, he's lying when he affirms his sovereignty. You know God can't do that. What gets into people's mind that they say that? Well, because we are free. And they see our freedom as being against his sovereignty. Men have the audacity to say that though the Bible says plainly that God is sovereign, it also says equally plainly that he's not sovereign because we're free. Now, as I say, you realize you've made a mistake when you come to a conclusion like that. So what you do is go back over again to find out why you erred, not the Bible. And where you erred is obvious. You are reading in to the notion of human freedom and responsibility, the exclusion of divine sovereignty. God didn't say any such thing as that. Logic doesn't say any such thing as that. You have lapsed into error at that point. You won't do that if you begin with the realization and never forget that this being the Word of God, it's impossible for it to contradict itself. The whole neo-orthodox theology is fundamentally based on the notion that this could happen. Number four, you normally expect other books not to contradict themselves, but you're not surprised when they do. You are not surprised. You're in a state of shock if the Word of God does. You know it doesn't, so when you think it does err, you know you err. Then look again until you find the correct interpretation has been what I have been illustrating on the board here. Another warning about the interpretation of the Bible, which is within the domain of any person who will follow proper procedures of interpretation, ascertaining what the message of God is. This book doesn't flatter, cajole, or cultivate. It blows your hard, built-up self-esteem Abandon pride all who enter here. If you are capable of being insulted, you can't interpret this book correctly. I mean, this book teaches us, here I am, suppose I just come out of nowhere and I stumble on the Bible and I start reading it and the uh, thing I find out is that I'm a hell-going sinner. I had a fairly decent conception of myself before I read that, and while I know I'm no paragon of excellence, I don't like to be told I was born in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me and that everything that I think and do is evil all the time. Brother, that's pretty hard to take. I remember once I was preaching a series of sermons on Romans. About three weeks, one of the leading elders left the church. Somebody asked him, why? Gerstner's too insulting. <laughs> Gerstner's too insulting. Paul's too insulting. And the Holy Spirit's too insulting. He's the one who said that there is no one who can stand before God guiltless. Their mouths are stopped. Everything they do is evil. And none who even seek God much less love him or do his will. Well, this gentleman just couldn't accept that. But instead of being honest enough to say, I don't believe the Bible. I can't accept the inspiration of Romans. I will not take lying down the proposition that I'm a gone sinner. And so on. Say that clearly and you can leave the church. You don't have to stay. If you're going to stay, that's the sort of thing you're going to hear from the Bible. But you see, the honest thing to do in a thing like that, somebody has said this is no religion for a gentleman. All right? If he insists on being a gentleman, 
And of course, he's going to have to realize this is no religion for him. This is no book for him. He can't enjoy it. He can't accept it and so on. He's going to put it out of his memory and all. That's the honest thing to do. But some, on the other hand, insist on twisting the book so that they can find a way of living with it, making it less offensive, salvaging their own reputation, assuming that they can be made acceptable to God by their own efforts. You just never will have any peace with the Bible that way. Now I say, if you are capable of being insulted, you can't interpret this book correctly. See, normally, and when we get into our discussion of salvation and so on later in this course, we'll see that it begins with conviction. The conviction that I am a sinner. I have a conviction until I come to that conviction that I'm a pretty decent person. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. I've got an excuse for everything I do that looks out of accord because fundamentally I'm a nice guy who aims in the right direction even if I sometimes misfire, but I am not potentially and actually a person who's hell-bent on self-destruction and the destruction of everybody else with me. Well, that's the way we live until we come under conviction of sin. I will develop that more fully later on. Here I just call your attention to it in connection with interpreting. Until you are convicted of your sin and still live with a conviction of your virtue, you'll find it impossible to interpret the Bible correctly. Something has to give. Your self-esteem or the biblical message. And if the self-esteem is the most desirable thing in your makeup, you, you'll twist the Bible or you'll reject the Bible. So when you have trouble, if any of you do have trouble reading the Bible, check and see whether that's the underlying source You'd probably say the Bible's difficult to understand or this looks incompatible or something like that. Check and see whether the problem is not in you rather than in what you are reading. Number seven, you won't believe what the Bible says if you won't believe how bad you are. Only conscious sinners can interpret the Bible honestly. You just simply can't let the Word of God have free course in you. That's number eight. The righteous can't let this Word have free course because that would spell the end of their self-righteousness. They have a vested interest in unsound interpreting. Look here. In most of the learned theological seminaries, the place where you study the Bible scientifically and professionally for a life, of interpreting the Bible. Most of the theological seminaries of the world are unsound. Most of them actually come out with the wrong interpretation, profoundly wrong interpretation. What's the explanation of it? How can the brainiest scholars in the world be the source of confusion? How can you have institutions which are supposed to train people in the proclamation of the truth of Holy Scripture who fundamentally are training them in the mal-representation of the gospel. Well, the explanation is precisely this. Fundamentally, they will not let the Word of God have free course in them. And you probe around to find out what their own plan of salvation is. It won't be anything about being washed in the blood of the Lamb. And they will certainly repudiate out of hand the notion that God had to shed his blood for the remission of their souls. You might have to squeeze some of this sort of thing out of them, but they go on. I remember a group of modern philosophers, for example, of whom it was said, there is no idea of hell tolerated around here. We won't allow it. Well, if they're honest scholars, they could still say, the Bible not only tolerates it, but it emphasizes it. And then we don't believe the Bible, but you never get a job in a seminary that way. If you're going to go in a seminary, you've got to 
look as if you do believe the Bible, which the church professes to be the foundation of her message. So somehow or other, but there's the explanation. By all this massive learning, and most of it at the present time, a profoundly, perversely incorrect translation of the Bible. It isn't a lack of brains, manifestly. These people have a cumin to spare. They're heavy on the gray matter. They don't need more doctoral degrees. The problem is elsewhere, and fundamentally it's the fact that they, no one will admit that he's not right in his own eyes and that he is such a goner that nothing but the grace of God could save him. Once you get that conviction, you're on the way to another pattern. And, of course, I'm fully aware, and so are you, that there are many people with brains to spare who are utterly orthodox. But it's not because of their brains. It's because of the fact that they have become convicted of their sins so that they can accept a message which otherwise would be too insulting. Number nine. They are not about to part with their pride because of the Word of God. Finally, 10. There's really only one unobvious rule in hermeneutics. Never forget the noetic influence of sin. That means a bad person is a bad interpreter. This is the other side of this, uh, this coin. This word comes from the Greek word nous, mind, the influence on the mind of sin. See, I'm saying this to all of us. Even if we become under conviction and conversion and are born again and so on, sin still remains. As John Murray would say, it no longer reigns, but it still remains. And consequently, we have to be on our guard at all time. We have turned away from the notion that we would justify whatever we do. Everything that we do is right in our own eyes. We know that's wrong. We know that we're acceptable to God only through the grace of Christ and by a new birth and so on. But while we won't succumb to that error of twisting the Bible to our own destruction, resting it to our own destruction... We must never forget that sin remains. People are often asking this question. I can only say a word on it here. How do you account for these insurmountable difficulty between Reformed Baptists and Reformed Presbyterians and Reformed Episcopalians and so on? Why can't we come together in those areas? Well, you know one thing. All of us know one thing. It's not the Bible's fault. It has to be our fault. Of course, they think it's my fault and I think it's their fault and so on, but we all agree on this. It's our fault, not God's fault, so let all of us be aware when it comes to interpreting the Word of God that we must tremble, as Isaiah says, lest we rest it to our own destruction.